Hello again, it's Dr. Coates. This is the, uh, I believe, the 9th of April. Uh, this is a lecture called The Concretist Lineage. It's the first lecture of Module 5. And once again, I apologize for giving recording a lecture at night. I know I like to get these things out a lot earlier in the day. Um, once again, I mean, it's April, I understand, and, and I hope you do too. Uh, this, this tends to be the month when, when your professors pile everything on all at once. Uh, so that's the reason why I don't have a tie-on and why I have these Maplethorpe uh, photographs behind me. Uh, this, by the way, is the easel that my daughter uses. Um, that's a ficus tree. This is our, our dining room. Anyway, um, so it's kind of like a whiteboard, chalkboard combination. Maybe you didn't want to know that. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, so this is a lecture on concretism, and, um, as, or the beginnings of it, and I'll continue with this on Thursday. Um, I don't know if this is clear, but we've been sort of building up to, you know, being able to, do, to uh, give really comprehensive readings of visual poetry since the very beginning of this course. Um, my hope here was uh, to let you know at the end that the English department here at, at Virginia Commonwealth University is um, participating with several other departments in a program called Media, Art, and Text. And there are uh, you know, many, many graduate students who have come here explicitly in order to, to participate in this interdisciplinary program, which is sponsored not just with English, but with uh, Mass Communications and the School of the Arts. Uh, so we actually have people who are um, sometimes your TAs in other English courses. Uh, many of them are involved in writing fiction and poetry, which is then solely published within the internet. And they are doing extremely interesting things um, with, uh, you know, the, the, the medium experimentation with, with uh, the medium by which these these texts are both produced and then purveyed to an audience. Uh, so, to, you know, just to let you know, there there are these vibrant uh, works of art which are being produced here at VCU. Uh, we have many of our faculty who are interested in doing it. My goal here has not been to offer any sort of comprehensive guide to what's being produced nowadays with visual poetry, but more just to sort of get you to the point where you could talk with them about it. Uh, because there are so many classes that are offered on a semester-by-semester -semester basis, uh, either in English or with this MATX program. Um, so it's kind of, you know, in the, in the same mode of advertising what English has to offer to you. Um, as a discipline, I'm also trying to advertise what future classes in English might offer to you should you choose to continue on with that, either with you know, an elective or uh, if you wanted to do a minor, or even to consider a major, perhaps a double major. I'm just putting it out there. You don't have to, but uh, but certainly it would be a chance to, to read these things that we love uh, in a more concerted way. So anyway, um, in case it wasn't clear, Module 5 is where I started when I was planning this course. And so in a sense, everything has been leading up to this. Um, this lecture is the preface to... Uh, that comes after all that prologue. So it's the preface to whatever's out left in this uh, module. I'm trying today to show how what happened with concretism, an early version of the visual poetry that we know and love today on the internet, was happening since the Elizabethan era of Shakespeare's day, and how visual poetry is really the emergence of a re reprioritizing of the visual over the aural senses in poetics. And if you're not reading the transcript, when I'm saying aural, I mean the A-U-R-A-L aural, not oral. Like I'm, I mean, I'm speaking it, but in a sense, the, 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 in the, the sense that you would also be hearing it with your ear, which is what I'm touching right now, in case you're not looking at the video. Uh, in a sense, all poems are visual when we read them. Handwritten manuscript or typeset page, there are strokes and squiggles in black offset against a blank white expanse on the page. But in another sense, one that most of us today may find quite foreign, I know this is true of me as well. This way of regarding poetry as a primarily visual genre is quite new, perhaps dating only back to the Second World War. Our old friend W.H. Auden from Module 4 has a famous essay called The Poet's Tongue from the mid-1930s, in which he speaks of the uh, unavoidable ability of poetry to create an insistent voice in our minds that possesses us and makes critical skepticism near impossible, at least until the voice is finished speaking, if not long after once the spell is worn off. The first time I read that essay, which was five years ago when I was finishing up my dissertation, uh, I did a professional double take, since that is most definitely not the way I think about poetry. And this is, you know, coming from somebody who considers himself to be pretty good at reading poems, you know. Um, it's just, you know, nearly completely foreign to the way that I think about doing it. Auden's essay turns out to be but the latest of a long line of writing about poetry, what we might call poetic theory, uh, that emphasizes the aural, or the sonorous qualities of the genre, almost to the exclusion of its visual properties. Uh, clearly, our paths have, have diverged 
if we're to the point now where uh, people are writing things that only ever appear on the internet and which have you know much more to do with the images that are associated with them um, than with the text themselves, um, or at least in the interplay of the of the image and the, and the text. Poetry written for the ear assumes that a reader, upon seeing glyphs on a page, instantly transforms those visual signs into sounds in his or her mind, conveniently ignoring the medium that transmitted those sounds. Uh, this is the sort of thing that we do when we go to a poetry reading, or at least it used to be. You know, you, you could finally forget about having to read these things on a page and just listen to the poet uh, talking to us. Just the voice is what we wanted. Um, and I suppose you could have gotten the same thing just by you know, buying a recording of a poet reading from his or her poetry. Um, there is too, you know, the, the sort of a, the, the same thing that happens when you go to see uh, a band that you like from their CD or, or from iTunes uh, in concert. You know, you want to see what it's like live rather than just being recorded. I, I, I understand that there's more more to a poetry reading than um, ignoring um, the words on the page, but it is quite different than poetry written for the eye, which exploits the presence of the visual medium to condition those sounds, which now seem more like concepts or visual constructs than the spoken resonances of an intimate friend. So as I've said in, in previous uh, lectures, poetry was originally an exclusively verbal genre. Whether you insist on thinking of the roots of poetry as the ancient Greek epic, uh, or whether you're you know, um, interested in expanding that definition out to include the beginnings of literature in all different cultures. So um, remember, uh, the ancient Greek epics, like for example, uh, uh, Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, existed for centuries as memorized texts that were spoken by travel, traveling, you know, the equivalent, the classical equivalent of the traveling minstrel, uh, epic tale tellers, you know, who used uh, the rhythms and uh, the sort of recurring epithets in order to um, remind themselves of what came next in the story. Or what some Native American literature specialists have called orature, uh, the lost literature of the American Indians, whose signs still exist, but whose exact contours and details have never been recorded, and so we don't know them exactly. Um, but at least since the invention of paper and the printing press, it has been possible to imagine what it would be like to ignore that spoken lineage and replace it with what the novelist James Joyce called, uh, quote, the ineluctable modality of the visual. The earliest poems in the first week folder of Module 5 are by George Herbert, a metaphysical poet and contemporary of John Donne, whom we read in the last module, of the generation just after William Shakespeare's, during the English Renaissance, many, many years ago. And clearly his poem, Easter Wings, is a poem about the Easter resurrection of Christ and the figure of a bird, and the orthography of the poem makes the text resemble the shape of a bird. I'm not saying it's a perfect fit, right? But I mean, what do you want? They're words, not watercolors. Similarly, the altar, also by Herbert, looks like a church altar if you turn it on its side and squint a little bit. Um, Herbert was obviously well ahead of his time in such visual experiments, but when we get to the modernist period, which occurred as a result of and just after the school of imagism that I talked about in module three, Artists began experimenting with most everything about the way literature was created and presented to audiences, including the visual medium that constitutes textuality. Even someone as conservative as Thomas Hardy, uh, whom you may know from Tess of the Durbervilles or Judy Obscure, Far From the Man Crowd, he's in some um, circles better known as a novelist than as a poet, although that's how he considered himself, um, fairly conservative in terms of the uh, verse forms and language that he used. Um, well, I, I'm sorry, I take back language, but I mean, um, because he was also a purveyor of dialect uh, from Wessex in the southwest of England. But uh, in terms of the verse forms that he used, uh, he was not necessarily an experimenter. But uh, his poem, the example that I, I placed in uh, the folder, The Convergence of the Twain, which was written after the sinking of the Titanic in 1911, and whose stanzas look either like little icebergs or little ocean liners, or both, uh, if you squint again, uh, responded to this heady vanguard of visual experimentation. Most modernist visual experimentation consisted of tabs, and here I just mean, you know, if you hit the tab on your keyboard and it moves over five or six. So if you remember Ezra Pound's The Return, which we read earlier, or even in a station of the Metro, you know, with a second lineup which is tabbed over uh, so that you would have that, even in something as short as in a station of the Metro, you know, there's still the, uh, the, the fact that he's making you, you move your eyes over a little bit. Um, that, that's a big part of that poem, considering how, how short it is. Um, sorry. Uh, you will see that, or of course also that sample poem by E.E. E. Cummings, um, or the entire Manifesto of Blast, with an exclamation point, 
uh, which was written almost entirely by Ezra Pound, who's sort of the ampresario behind uh, Vorticism, which is the successor to Imogen. Um, you will see that some part of the effect of reading the poem or the manifesto is produced by the oddly stylized presentation of words and unconventional arrangements in white space. Again, only in terms of the conventions that already pre-existed uh, and which audiences at the time must have expected. Uh, although perhaps not as flashy, or to some readers gimmicky, as Herbert's totally visual poems, it is interesting to think of modernist poetry normalizing visual experimentation, even as the poets themselves, like Auden, still thought of poetry as a voice speaking out of the darkness. These are the immediate predecessors of concretism, an international school of poetry that sprung up as a response to modernism after World War II. It is most definitely poetry written for the eye, as is visual poetry, but it existed in its entirety well before the invention of the internet, and well before personal computers as we know them today, or even on people's radar. I mean, radar existed, don't get me wrong, but that, that's about it. Um, <laughs> anyway, they're all about the material textuality of poetry. Not only do they require the reader to make something of their visual appearance on the page, but they make the reader into a viewer, and the, become, the poem becomes not a time-lapse spell of finite duration um, so much as an infinitely regressing recursion of eyewitness, or at the same time, a completely static instant. It happens once and never again. The concretist poem is more an experience of a visual phenomenon than a voice speaking to us out of the darkness. And indeed, this is why I preface this module with posthumanism, uh, sort of the death of the self, or trying to figure out what poems might be like after you surrender uh, the obligation to represent a personality or a consciousness through a poem. It's only after you get to that point that you can take the next step and really stop having a voice behind it altogether and merely produce a visual representation that the reader has to grapple with, reader, viewer, in this case. Uh, you would need to ponder what a poem would be like without a persona to reconstruct around the speaker's voice before you could decide what to do with a poem like Eugen Gomringer's Silencio. I would argue that this poem, which is also on, under the um, you know uh, week one set of poem, uh, folder of poems on the fifth module, I would argue that Silencio does not reconstruct a personality at all, or if you prefer a consciousness, unless that consciousness is of language itself. The removed middle silencio within the block of comparable repeated silencios within that poem is sort of a meditation on absence and presence, I suppose, since the absence of the word in the middle that refers to silence is in effect a deeper silence than the word itself means or has been allowed to signify. In that last parenthesis, has been allowed to signify, you see me as a reader reflexively reaching back to the mind behind the concretist poem that must kind of exist, you know, especially if you've convinced yourself that there's always a mind speaking, or I'm thinking, and then speaking orally uh, from within a poem. But even so, I am constructing not a persona, but the figure of the artist who wrote those blocks of text right, and then arranged them in space behind the visual construction. Someone who creates visual puzzle, puzzles and then sets me, the reader or viewer, on a task to unravel them, not a voice whose problems have been seeded into a text to set me on the goal of getting to know her or him better. Right? It seems to me a crucial difference between concretism and the, the other types of poetry that we've been reading in this class. The concretist poem is the best example that I know of of meaningful interaction between form and function in the history of poems becoming more and more visual. The sort of internet-based visual poetry being produced in contemporary uh, culture seems to me a variant of graphic design. I'm not saying it's not literature, I'm just saying it's very different than what concretism is trying to do, where the visual relation is taken for granted and made into an aesthetic experience, rather than being justified as the proper medium for the ideas that are presented within the poem, right? There's no sense of justification in uh, visual poetry within, or I'm sorry, there's no sense of the need for justification within uh, contemporary culture's visual poetry. That's a result of concretism's unique appearance right at the intersection of modernism and what came right after modernism, what, what is called postmodernism, uh, which took many of the radical experiments and ironies of the modernist period, uh, right after World War I and then ending around World War II, and then set those experiments and ironies up as norms to be played with, without the earlier generation's sense of loss about those conventions. It's kind of like, why would we have had conventions at all, the postmodernists ask. The whole point of literature in this case is to play around with these tropes and conventions rather than to try to find something better, which would suffice, uh, rather than the things that seem so outdated and outmoded at this point. <laughs>
the concretists grew up being told that poems spoke to them, and so they justified their new visual experiments within their poems. Visual poets never had to do that, in part because of the concretists. Okay? On Thursday, I'll take you through the French poet Guillaume Apollinaire's Caligram and the extraordinary work of the Brazilian brothers de Campos, Geraldo and Augusto, to elaborate more on the ins and outs of concretism, but I'm going to be using Thursday's lecture to set up the language poetry of the next two weeks in the module, all of which draw on the visual freedoms of concretism while also drawing away from visuality as a rationale for poetic existence. I know that was kind of a, a complex sentence at the end, but I think you're up to it. So, until then, onward. And um, again, sorry about the lateness of this and for being a little bit stuffed up. Sorry, it's that time of the semester. <laughs>